Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Kepler Income and Growth event. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, markets have not been at their healthiest recently. Uh, consequently, discounts across the investment trust sector are quite wide. Uh, this week, we're going to be hearing from a number of managers of investment trusts about uh, what the opportunities are for their, uh, their strategies in the long run. Uh, surely, we'll be hearing from Chetan Segal, um, the lead manager of Templeton Emerging Markets. Before I hand over, just a quick reminder that if you wish to add a question, please do so in the chat box, which should be probably on the right of your screen. Uh, we should have around 30 minutes for presentation and then 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. And so with that, I will hand over to Chetan. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm based here in Singapore. And it's a pleasure to address you. Uh, so you know, it, it's after a long time when people are really looking at the markets and wondering what is really going on. And our philosophy is really to look back at the basics. And I think the first slide really talks about it, that emerging markets generate 65% of the global growth. Uh, this is of 2022. Uh, but when emerging markets started off, emerging markets were uh, generating only around 35 to 40 percent of global growth. So, so in a 30-year period, emerging markets, which were around 40 percent of global growth, are now accounting for 65 percent of global growth. Uh, Temit, as you all know, is an emerging markets investment trust, and there are several risk factors associated with investment in emerging markets as well as uh, what happens in the market in general. Uh, there has been a lot of volatility, as Thomas pointed out, uh, not just in emerging markets for the first time, but uh, it's, it's across all markets, and, and there's been a lot of fluctuation of share prices and net asset values, and uh, there are a lot of other risk factors which are there, which, and I encourage you all to look at the risk section in the uh, Tebit annual report. So let me give you an introduction to Temit. Uh, we have been uh, as a trust, listed trust for over 30 years, and we are quite differentiated, we believe. Uh, number one, we are an uh, active, high conviction investment trust. Uh, we do provide exposure to all cap opportunities and have recently got permission to do unlisted exposures as well. Uh, our focus really is on governance and sustainability of of the investment ideas as well and and the fund trust itself is structured in such a way that it has sound governance practices it is the largest investment emerging market investment trust listed in uk uh, we have a provision for gearing and uh, we have adopted it sparingly thus far as the markets have been quite volatile and the other attribute for the trust is really the uh, shareholder friendly features such as uh, the board uh, conducting regular buybacks of uh, the unit so that uh, shareholder net asset value is enhanced. We do adopt a consistent investment philosophy and uh, this is something which we've really focused on, not compromised on and uh, our belief is that alpha is generated by investing in stocks which have sustainable earning power and buying them at a discount to intrinsic worth. Uh, by sustainable means that we look at competitive advantages of companies and resilience of companies across business environments across long time periods. And therefore that necessitates us to be long term oriented. Uh, we are focused on earnings power because we believe that you need to in, uh, look at not just the uh, current earnings, but the potential of uh, profits which a, a business or a company can generate uh, based on fundamental analysis. And therefore, by definition, we are bottom-up. And we are consistently valuation aware. We look at our portfolio uh, versus the market in terms of growth rates, in terms of profitability, in terms of uh, uh, the, the discount which our portfolio has as compared to the market. And I'd just like to quote uh, Sir John Templeton and uh, that usually the best bargains are not the stocks whose prices are down the most. And at this point in time, 
there are many stocks which are whose prices are down quite a lot uh, but rather those stocks who have the lo lowest earning power uh, lowest prices in relation to possible earnings power in the future years so so we are still looking at uh, companies which have in our opinion uh, got the best fundamentals uh, for the long term the investment team uh, We've just shown our CIO, uh, Manraj. Um, I, uh, I am Jetan Sehgal. I have been uh, with Templeton for 30 years. And Andrew Ness, uh, who is also at 27 years of experience, has been with us for the last four years. And uh, Temit has a lot of investment offices all across emerging markets. Uh, we believe in the philosophy of being local everywhere so that we have local insights into uh, coming into our portfolio decisions and stock selection as well. So let me give you some market overview and let's go back to the fundamentals of emerging markets because when we started out uh, in the late uh, 1980s and 19, early 1990s, emerging markets were really all about commodities, you know, and and uh, it was, you know, they were the lead uh, commodity supplier for the industrialization of the West. And uh, that that still holds good today as well. So, uh, you know, the commodities may have changed. Uh, iron ore may not be as important as it was previously. Uh, oil is still quite important, but maybe it reduces in importance. But even the new commodities which are used for, say, electric vehicles like lithium or copper, which is going to be used in a lot of electric vehicles, etc., uh, they are uh, basically coming from emerging markets. So, so I think the the foundation for emerging markets, which was based uh, when we started off uh, on, on low cost production of commodities, uh, still holds good. Obviously, we've uh, eliminated now Russia from this, uh, the, these slides because Russia is no longer investable for us. And, uh, but, but despite Russia not being there, I think emerging markets still are the uh, leading source of commodities uh, for, the, for the rest of the world. The second main element of emerging markets has also not changed. It is about the manufacturing costs uh, per hour. So, so emerging markets had commodities, and a lot of uh, a lot of factories in the West said that listen, uh, they've also got low cost of production in terms of wages, and uh, that holds good today as well. And you see a lot of factories, uh, notwithstanding the fact that West is finally uh, trying to build factories uh, internally as well, but a lot of factories are still being uh, built within emerging markets. Obviously, trade conflicts and other issues have ensured that you know different regions have different growth rates in terms of factory setups. Uh, but we still see a lot of factories being set up all across emerging markets uh, to cater to the future needs of both their local markets as well as the West. We move on. Uh, we, the next step after commodities and really manufacturing was the rise of the consumer. Uh, we've seen that over a long period of time, and uh, the consumer markets uh, of, of Asia particularly did extremely well, and uh, and they still hold good because if you look at the population change and uh, between 2021 and 2030, uh, India still will be adding nearly 17% of the global growth. A lot of the other markets, which are some of them are frontier as well, are going to see a lot of growth in population. And and I think we often don't uh, talk about it, but uh, you know demographics really plays a lot of uh, role in in determination of uh, future economic earning opportunities. Uh, for example, if you see China came off quite dramatically in terms of uh, number of live births in the last five years, so. Uh, and that had a bearing on uh, demand as well. But but if you look at the next uh, middle class consumer segment, it's still Asia going to uh, lead. 86, 87% of the next uh, billion are going to come from Asia. And if you look at um, just this is one indicator, you know, of passenger car penetration. Uh, emerging markets are still uh, very, very uh, underpenetrated as compared to the uh, developed world. So, so it is passenger cars, but if you look at, you know, uh, we say uh, the basic elements, uh, food, clothing, shelter, uh, 
you know, all these are really determined by demographics. Uh, then the other issue is electricity, uh, mobility, and transportation. So, so these are going to be very uh, important elements. And in fact, uh, you know, many of these uh, are now getting very expensive for the emerging uh, markets. Uh, for example. I think we might have temporarily lost chat on there, uh, thanks to uh, dodgy Wi-Fi. Hopefully he'll pop back on soon. Um, we give him a couple of minutes and uh, perhaps if you have any questions, please put, put them in the chat box and we'll have them ready when he comes back. You know? Can you hear me Actually, now? So we, we can hear you now, yeah. I'm so sorry, yeah. Uh, we've had this uh, connection since morning. So I talked about the consumer and I hope everybody uh, understood whatever I had to say, but I just to repeat the last sentence, uh, it is about the demand for uh, food, clothing, shelter, electricity, uh, which is energy, uh, telecommunications and transportation. I think these are very, very important elements, especially uh, at the lower end of the uh, per capita income. So the next thing about emerging markets, you know, you start from commodities, you talk about cost of production, you talk about the consumers, and then emerging markets really evolved into change agents. And you can see the amount of patents which were filed from Asia, uh, China, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, they grew up in, uh, they grew in terms of uh, uh, patent share. And that led to a lot of change because if you look at the adoption of photovoltaic cells, uh, you know, China is the world leader. If you look at battery electric cars, China is a leader, but, you know, Korea is a leading manufacturer of uh, of uh, battery electric vehicles. China is a big manufacturer. So, so along with the patents came technology improvements, and in many cases, emerging markets have uh, surpassed uh, some of the uh, developed markets. And uh, then, you know, the issue comes up as to uh, the chip wars. I mean, that's the latest thing which has come up as to, uh, you know, you have technology and you, then you start getting into uh, manufacturing of uh, solar batteries and also chips. You can see how Taiwan and Korea and China have been uh, dominant in terms of manufacture of chips. And this is something which no one can do without. And uh, it's no doubt that uh, the U.S. has seen this as a, as a as a big issue on their security and uh, have now tried to get the manufacturing back into the U.S. Uh, the same thing is about memory. So, you know, chips are two types, logic and memory. Uh, again, most of it is dominated by Korea. Uh, little part of it is in the U.S. and Japan as well. So, so this, this is a nutshell is really the evolution for emerging markets and why we believe that the trends are still very strong and could continue for quite some time. But then that brings us to the current uh, environment, which is really uh, what's happened in the, especially year to date. Uh, you know, we start from 1990 and 1990 is very important because that's the time uh, when the, you know, Berlin Wall had actually fallen and India and China had not yet devalued uh, to come Come, come into the local economy. So we start from 1990, and if you look at purchasing power parity, I think some of it is just the current year, but uh, many of the currencies are quite undervalued as we see it today. And in our models, um, we found that, uh, you know, generally PPP valuations uh, tend, the, the uh, valuations of currency do move around the PPE valuations over a longer period of time. So we have, uh, undervalued currencies in our in our belief system. Um, we have low price earnings ratio. So this is the uh, next slide is the price earnings ratio of uh, the high, low, and the current price earnings. And you can see uh, Eastern Europe of obviously is beaten down because of what's happening in Ukraine and, and the war, but, but Latin America is down too. And uh, emerging markets is probably uh, still at the lower band of its range. And, and the only market which has really stood up quite well uh, apart from India, is really MENA, which is 
the Middle East and North Africa, which have been a beneficiary of uh, the the oil, the increase in oil prices. So emerging markets are discounted today, uh, much more discounted than the developed markets are, and and we find that their currencies are undervalued as well. The other thing uh, in emerging markets is that the debt is still lower than the developed market. So uh, that the debt ratios are still lo uh, lower. Yes, in uh, you know the aggregate global debt has gone up quite significantly, but emerging markets still are uh, you know quite underlevered as compared to the developed markets, and therefore uh, one one would feel that uh, uh, you know they they still have a potential for credit increase. So countries like Mexico, etc., where credit penetration is uh, still very low. Uh, then we come to the major issues, uh, you know, impacting the emerging markets at, at the current juncture, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions on on this. So, so the first thing is, uh, uh, you know, the issue on China because China is the largest emerging market. It is 30% of the emerging market index, and uh, last year everybody was saying that listen, we look, need to look at Gem X China because China has become too big. And uh, now people say, let's look at Gem X China because China is too uncertain, you know. So, so it, 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 there is a cyclical element to it. There could be some structural elements as well. Uh, but the key questions in China really are uh, the policy making is not really market driven. It is driven by uh, the priorities of the government, uh, which is basically the Chinese Communist Party, and and they are uh, they they do follow their philosophy. And, and therefore, one has to read it and not misread it. And uh, uh, because China has been a very productive part of the global economy in, in terms of leading to global growth, and and one needs to understand the policy environment under which China is making its uh, its decisions. So uh, you can see, uh, you know, by the time 2019 hit or 2000, early 2020, China had already reached a debt peak and. Uh, they spent a lot of time. They did not uh, pump too much money in the COVID period, and they've tried to keep their total debt under control. Um, the other issue on China is its strategy towards COVID, and you know whether uh, there's a lot of faith of uh, the Chinese people on the government, and and uh, and they uh, and really the uh, COVID-19 strategy of China is still not yet worked out. Uh, every Week there's some new rumor of whether they'll open up or not open up, but uh, really this is something which uh, one needs to look at. And for each, you know, you have to have a time period, you know. So if you can see certainly that China is going to open up, I think the markets will behave in a different way. And the last question for China is really about conflict. That does the economic conflict also lead to uh, uh, a, a real conflict on, on uh, in terms of a war or something like that? And and the implications which uh, you know come from a conflict, uh, we've seen it recently. Uh, you know where uh, Russia and, uh, and and Ukraine there was a conflict, there was a spike in energy, uh, food and metal prices, and and the food prices have still remained quite elevated, and metal prices have come down. Uh, uh, this is really a result of uh, the expectation that we are going into slowdown, but but the world will. And uh, telecommunications and and mobility. So, so I think one needs to really look at uh, the implications of these conflicts uh, on on the markets, and and we need to factor that in as well. And the other issue, which is really a longer term issue uh, facing emerging markets, really is about climate. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different uh, uh, nomenclatures out there: net zero, carbon neutrality, but but by and large. Uh, there is an arbitrage which could occur, and and you know a lot of uh, we've already seen one or two companies uh, uh, from the 2050 club uh, selling their assets to the 2070 club, etc. So, so I think climate is going to become a big issue as well. And right now, it it needs uh, all the world to come together to solve this issue. Uh, COP 27 is going on, and uh, 
uh, it remains to be seen that whether the commitments of the countries are still as uh, steadfast or do they uh, waver in in the light of global slowdown so so that's on climate as well then we just talk about temet and its performance uh, we've had a challenging uh, actually 24 months uh, the the first part came really because of uh, the china policy environment where uh, the china uh, you know there was a big decline in stocks of the internet etc driven essentially by uh, chinese policy and uh, we did uh, we were impacted negatively and and then uh, the from 2021 to 22 we were impacted uh, by by the conflict in russia where uh, many of our assets were marked to zero and and we've actually suffered as a result of that so so last two years uh, have been tough for us uh, they've been tough for many emerging market investors and uh, for us in particular uh, as a result of the conflict in russia and and, and the policy making in china essentially uh, over a 10 year period over a long period i think the uh, trust has still generated excess returns as you can see and uh, you know those excess returns have been quite uh, uh, you know, quite uh, significant as compared to the benchmarks. Uh, but recently, we have uh, suffered as a result of, uh, especially year to date, as a result of what's happened in Russia. Just to talk about performance attribution by securities, uh, you know, we've continued to be overweight in Brazil, which is one of our large markets uh, where the interest rate environment is of positive real rates, Itau and Badesco are uh, two of our large holdings which have done quite well. Uh, India has done extremely well as I spoke uh, to you about. India's ICICI Bank has done extremely well for us, Bajaj Holdings. So those have been the contributors and I think the detraction has come from, uh, some of it has come from uh, the exposure to Saudi market. We don't have and uh, significant exposure to the Saudi market, and we are slightly underweight India, and uh, Reliance Industries have done well, and and uh, and uh, these uh, the MENA markets, as I said, have done extremely well. There's also been a, so in terms of detraction from companies which we own, uh, you know the the tech sector has corrected quite a bit, so all these names are related to the tech sector, and we can talk about our views on the tech sector. We we essentially believe that uh, although there there is earnings downgrade and and there is demand destruction taking place, I think the uh, competitive advantages of many of these companies has not been impacted uh, as a result of the slowdown and and we think that the industry has actually got a significant uh, advantage or a benefit uh, with a lot of trade restrictions coming into the industry where. Uh, where it's very difficult for other countries to uh, get this technology. So, so many of these companies are going through a downturn, but their longer-term uh, structure is still not impacted negatively. Um, we also got impacted on the e-commerce stock. Some of it was, you know, the, the earnings coming out because of policy changes, and and in some cases the markets have slowed down, and and there's a higher interest rate, and and valuations have got impacted. So. So this is the uh, performance attribution by security for one year. This actually excludes Russia because Russia itself, uh, everything got marked to zero over a period of time. Uh, how are we positioned today? Uh, these are the top 10 holdings for us uh, in terms of active weight. Um, ICICI Bank, uh, which is uh, an exposure to India, has done extremely well. India is a, as a market is doing quite well as a lot of manufacturing is shifting back in, uh, is shifting to india uh, as a result of second sourcing and and uh, and the consumer is also doing quite well as a result of the fact that uh, it had done, done such uh, had done so well over the last uh, one year so so we we have exposure to icici bank as our largest active weight uh, tsmc has come down a lot uh, both tsmc and mediatek as as i spoke about the impact of the uh, technology slowdown we think uh, we still think that the structural trend is still quite solid and uh, and over a period of time as as these companies cut back on capacity expansion there will be a rebound in in overall uh, uh, demand and earnings as well alibaba got impacted because of policy but 
now the valuations we think are quite uh, quite uh, reasonable uh, lg corp is a um, is basically a holding company uh, holding company which has done quite well it's been quite resilient uh, they do they are they not only pay out uh, uh, cash flow but they also doing a buyback which has helped the companies a never is as i mentioned earlier got impacted by demand declines a genpact is a company which is business process outsourcing so this is just giving you a flavor of the kind of companies which you own so this is a business process outsourcing company uh they they are not an it services company but they do business process outsourcing where uh, they take costs out for companies and a lot of uh, overseas clients are also now looking to cut costs again in this environment and genpact will be a beneficiary um Tinsi is a company manufacturing electrolytes. Uh, this is a Chinese company. Uh, the reason why we like it is because it supplies material uh, to the top three uh, electric vehicle battery manufacturers. So they supply material to Tesla. They supply material to LG uh, LG Chem, which is a large uh, uh, battery company, and they also supply uh, material to CATL, which is the largest chinese battery company so so we have tinsi there uh, bradesco we spoke about and and samsung electronics uh, where we've trimmed recently uh, because the earnings are into short are going uh, are getting depressed because of the sick cycle and we've lowered the overweight but uh, structurally the company uh, still seems to be solid in terms of geography uh, Asia, we are probably neutral. We are slightly overweight on, on Latin America, and uh, it, our biggest underweight really comes from Middle East, and uh, you know th that's where uh, uh, they've, the markets have done extremely well. Uh, oil prices have been quite high, and uh, uh, we are underweight that market as we think that oil prices will normalize over a period of time, and some of the earnings uplift may not be that sustainable. In terms of sector, we are still overweight IT, but not to the same extent as we were previously. Uh, financials we have built uh, over a period of time, and, and that has done quite well for us. Uh, consumer discretionary, we are slightly underweight. Uh, I think the environment is still challenging, and and uh, the consumer is getting uh, impacted. Uh, communication services also we are uh, slightly underweight, uh, and most uh, nothing else is of real note. We are underweight utilities. And we are underweight uh, real estate, where we have only a small exposure uh, to the real estate sector. So that is my presentation, and uh, I, I'll be happy to take uh, questions from here on. Thanks very much, Jetan. Um, we have a, a number of questions that have already come in, uh, but if you're in the audience, um, we've got 15 minutes or so, so um, please do your question. Uh, first of all, we had a, a couple of questions around the uh, decision to seek authorization for investing in unlisted equities. Could you just explain what, what's the rationale for that and you, what sort of allocation might you get? And would this be pre-IPO investments or longer longer time frame? What exactly do you expect to do with that permission in the future? Yeah, so, you know, the trust itself has... Uh... You know, it's been there for 30 years, and uh, we have to look at the trust from as a going concern and not just as a fund. And uh, you know, there are a lot of opportunities which keep coming up. Uh, there are a lot of changes taking place in the environment. A lot of new businesses are emerging, and um, and at some stage, it makes sense to buy these companies. I, and there's a huge, uh, you know, unlisted market out there because of private equity or venture capital. Capitalists have actually funded these companies, and and we felt that we should have this enabling opportunity. We haven't deployed anything as yet. We've looked at few names uh, here and there, some something which adds value to uh, the trust in terms of diversification or a return upside or a growth upside. So we've asked for permission. We've got the permission. We haven't deployed anything yet. Uh, this is for the long term. Uh, private uh, markets are not yet corrected to the same extent as the public markets have and uh, and many times you know you get these opportunities and you want to be a willing participant and we will only use it if we 
feel that there's something exceptional going to be coming to the trust rather than just to use it as a matter of tactical allocation. Uh, and we have a question around the geographical allocation. So given your emphasis on growth, why have you been more exposed to China and South Korea, whereas so little exposed to India? Yeah, so it's it's a function of uh, both growth and valuations, and uh, it's not necessary that you can play, uh, you know, um, it, growth in India by having exposure just to India. For example, uh, I just, uh, you know, recently just Diwali is over and and Samsung has reported that they've had blockbuster sales in India, uh, selling mobile phones, etc. So, so there's a lot of uh, trade which takes place between countries and and um, uh, and so you have to look at the, so you don't, we don't actually expose ourselves to countries so much, but we expose ourselves to the growth which companies get through the exposure to different countries. So, so and, and then you have to look at valuations as well and uh, where, where we are in the cycle and uh, no doubt India has had a, a strong run as a result of, uh, you know, manufacturing shifting to India, IT services doing quite well uh, and, and we have to really look at uh, uh, where we, have, we find the best risk and reward uh, on an overall basis. And turning to the sector allocations, are you still comfortable being overweight uh, to uh, information technology given the sell-off that we've seen in the US, but, but also elsewhere this year? Yeah, so um, th that's a good question. So we did lower our weights. So, you know, we still believe in the structural trends uh, in, in the technology sector and and the IT sector per se is actually very well diversified. You know, it comprises it comprises the software services companies as well, and the hardware companies and and the semiconductor companies. Uh, so so it has a lot of uh, different angles to it. There are some com consumer companies as well. So so IT is very well diversified. Uh, there are some segments which have got impacted. Like for example, uh, the semiconductor side has got impacted quite significantly. Uh, but the IT services are probably uh, still quite okay. They've had some slowdown, but not that much. Uh, but the business models are good and the strengths are quite unique uh, because if you look at uh, you know IT services uh, India has really got a dominant play there and uh, and is doing quite well in in terms of manufacture I talked about chips you know TSMC is 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 a company which which once told me that we are in an industry where being number two is not being good enough you know so um, that company is the leading uh, provider of all uh, Technology to all the to all the late leading edge, uh, you know, uh, application processors, etc. So, so TSMC is there. So, so it's just the competitive strength of these companies in these industries which lead us to be there. You know, if you're if you're global number one and you're you're the best in class uh, in terms of uh, the metrics, governance, etc., uh, then then chances are that you'll find their way in, into the Temet portfolio. And sticking perhaps by implication with TSMC, uh, how do you mitigate risks associated with the uh, China-Taiwan conflict? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, structurally we are underweight uh, China plus Taiwan combined, and and uh, it's it's difficult. I mean, because we've got a recent experience of what's happened in Russia, and God forbid that should not happen in in China, Taiwan, but. But the companies themselves are diversifying. Like for example, TSMC is setting up uh, a fab in in Japan. It's setting up a fab in the in the US. Uh, and so it's a question of time, you know, and whether they will be able to diversify and and when does this actually happen? Because these risks have always been there. Uh, but but what we've d done differently from uh, from our exposure to Russia is that collectively we are not that significantly overweight. Uh, China to Taiwan. In fact, we are slightly underweight uh, the two markets combined. And in many of the companies, uh, we've also started engaging with them as to, uh, you know, what what their options are. And, and I think many of the companies are also thinking about 
it in in that direction you know so so we are seeing that and some of, some of it the risk will be lowered by us and some of it we believe will be lowered by political powers by uh, that are and and some of the companies will themselves try to lower the risk So the, the US dollar has obviously been extremely strong this year. Uh, has that affected your companies and what's your outlook? Yeah, so I think there are two ways, uh, two things about it. One is the US dollar has been strong, but the other thing is the US rates have been high. So, you know, the 10 years also changed. Uh, the, uh, a year back, the 10 year was probably in the twos, and now it's probably. Uh, Near 4.15 or so. So your cost of capital has gone up, and and uh, many many investors are using a much higher cost of capital and making the allocation towards debt and equity. Um, so I I think as long as the rates continue to be high, it'd be very difficult to argue against the dollar because a lot of people will just find themselves using this uh, risk-free rate and making an allocation uh, based on that. I think once the rates do come off and do taper off, uh, I think then the emerging markets will have, or or maybe all the markets will have a very strong rally. Um, you know, so it's uh, so I think that is the that is how we are positioned right now. I, I, I it's difficult to give a view on the dollar without giving a view on the rates because I, we believe that if the rates come down, the U.S. dollar may not be that strong, and um, and uh, but. But it seems unlikely uh, that this will play out in the next six months. Maybe it will uh, play out slightly later than that, and uh, and maybe the markets will see it coming, you know, and start rallying in advance of a U.S. Uh, dollar rates going down, and therefore the dollar itself might start weakening a little bit. So, do you, do you have in mind what what you think we should be looking for? Are, are you what what are the Fed are looking for? Are they are they waiting for do you think weakness in the economy, or is it is it a sign that inflation has come past a certain point, or maybe a peak in the oil price? Do you have any strong yeah, I, view? I, yeah, I think the the I think the Fed itself in its decision making will look for data, so they will look for hard data, and and the markets will not wait for data. The markets will uh, have a sense of you know what what they expect the Fed to do. So I I think the markets will lead in this, and and we. We usually find that the markets have around a six months uh, kind of, you know, uh, they lead by uh, approximately six months. So, so if you do expect that uh, interest rates will stabilize or start coming down, uh, it's just like it's just like the zero COVID in China. You know, when when does that policy get uh, relaxed, right? So, does it happen? So no. So everybody's talking about second quarter of next year. You know, and and maybe these two uh, these two are quite coincidental and and that can lead to a, a good rally in markets you know and i was actually going to ask about that do you do you have a view i mean we were we were expecting the um zero covid policy you know it was it was commonly held belief that it would be lifted um following xi's re-election but it seems that, that the authorities are committed to longer term is this problematic for uh, you know for your your portfolio in particular? Um, and what are your expectations? Do you, you know they're, they're saying they're still committed to this policy? Is is Q1 likely end date, or is this likely to persist for longer? Yeah, I think it, it depends upon their uh, uh, you know the the progress of vaccination as well. So and the confidence. So th I I think China does. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, it is quite a planned economy. So they will, even if they open up, it won't be a, uh, you know, it won't be a free for all. It'll just be very, very measured and controlled, and 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 over a period of time, it'll open up. So, so even if there's an opening up, I mean, one doesn't know how the virus will mutate. I don't, we don't know what is the amount of hospitalizations which take place. But, but one can guess if the virus is really, uh, you know, not that lethal. Uh, then at some stage they will open up during next year, and uh, so we are not really predicting a time. But as long as you see that as an ultimate eventuality that it will be lifted, uh, and, and then I think you can still trade for that and invest for that. So it's the same thing about the U.S. Uh, interest rates, right? As long as there's an eventuality that the rates will come down, 
then you can still invest uh, based on that premise. So, so I think th those two probably will happen probably second to third quarter, I would say. Uh, but we weren't surprised because our analysts on the ground uh, never felt that this is an election issue. I mean, that once the re-election will happen, it'll open up. So we were anyway internally bracing ourselves for, uh, you're talking about the second quarter, et cetera. So, uh, because the COVID wave has yet to hit the country, you know. So as yet, it's not happened. Uh, so, so I think it'll take some time. A couple more minutes left. Um, I'll try and squeeze in a couple of questions. Um, the other very topical event in emerging markets in the last few days has been the election in Brazil. Do you um, have any view on the change of government there? Is it likely to be effective, positive for uh, stocks or not? Yeah, you know, so uh, just so one is the presidential election, which was very it was a close uh, contest, and the other is the fact that a lot of the governors are also, you know, the, the Congress itself is very central, and and the governors are also quite central. So, so to that extent, I think the country has not given a mandate for really a left uh, leftist kind of government. So, so it's a very neutral kind of mandate, and and if uh, Lula, you know, is is now probably a statesman more than you know, uh, uh, an upcoming politician. So I think he's more a statesman. And I think with a larger heart, he can probably do a lot of good and, you know, he may want to uh, cement his legacy as a as a good leader. So so I don't think it will be very disruptive to uh, to the markets. Uh, but but one never knows, you know, with, with politics, but there's a risk factor to it. But my sense is that it may not be that disruptive as, as it could be had it been a very divided, I mean, a very uh, clear mandate to to be on the left. Uh, maybe sneaking a final question on uh, China's demand for commodities. Uh, been it's an often watched uh, series of metrics. Um, what's what's the outlook there for uh, Chinese demand for commodities? So you know you go back a little bit. So you know if you look at the demographics, uh, they have really changed. So you know China was having in two, 2014 20 million live births and uh, uh, per year, and now this is down to 11 million. So so demographics have changed. Uh, the Chinese government is very uh, clear that they want to control the debt level. So you know it's not about uh, printing money and and consuming etc. So so I think the debt levels are also under control. And and therefore, uh, one has to believe uh, that if the demographics have changed and the government is very clear that they don't want over leverage building up in the system, then the natural demand will probably settle at a lower level as compared to previously. Even even the infrastructure spending which they have now picked up. So, as we speak, our sense is that the infrastructure spending in in uh, China has actually picked up quite uh, significantly. Even though there has been more lockdowns, but uh, in in the month of uh, October, uh, but but really it's been areas of water conservation and you know under underground metros etc. So so there's been a pickup in uh, acceleration in uh, fixed asset investment. A lot of projects happening. You speak to cement companies. Cement companies are saying they are uh, you know they are plus Y O Y basis now. So. So, so the demand is definitely coming back, but it may not come back in the same industries, uh, which, you know, like it may not be steel intensive or something like that. So, brilliant. Well, uh, thanks very much, Chetan, for your presentation and for asking all those questions. Um, and thank you to the audience uh, for your interest. Um, we will uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully back uh, tomorrow. Uh, at 11 a.m. we have uh, we'll be hearing from the managers of Brunner. Uh, but for now, Chetan, thanks very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you all, and uh, all the very best. Thank you. Bye.